Good morning. Today we come to a parable in Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, the first 15 verses. It's called uh, The Shrewd Business Manager. And I'd invite you now to take your Bibles, open to uh, the Gospel of Luke, and read at least the first eight verses, uh, although um, you could read all 15, but we will go through verses 8 through 15 uh, together in just a moment. So put me on pause, get out your Bible, read the passage that we're going to look at. Now, as I said, this is one of my all-time favorite parables. I'm not sure what commends this parable to me uh, in such a way, but be because it is a difficult parable, it requires a, a good deal of thought and reflection, and maybe that's what commends it. Jesus is teaching us again some very critical uh, principles, uh, values of God's kingdom. You remember now that Jesus doesn't tell us parables to uh, entertain us. These are not whimsical, uh, cute little stories. He wants us to make a decision to change the way we live, to live according to uh, values, uh, kingdom values, and, and to look at life as his father does, as God does. So if we are going to be members of his uh, kingdom, Christians, uh, then we need to learn uh, kingdom values. Uh, we need to hear the lessons in this parable, and we certainly need to look at life uh, as God does. Well, the first thing that we know about every parable is that we uh, want to know uh, the audience to whom Jesus is speaking. And quite interestingly, this uh, audience that he's speaking to in this parable is the same audience that he was speaking to back when we looked at the wealthy man and Lazarus. That is also in chapter 16 of Luke's gospel. But here we are in the first 15 verses. But let me read for you um, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 15 of Luke, which defines the audience for us uh, specifically. The tax collectors and sinners uh, had gathered around to hear him. So Jesus had left this luncheon that he had had with the Pharisees uh, in chapter 14. He was now traveling and walking, and these uh, social outcasts of the day came and gathered around because they were interested in hearing about this kingdom that Jesus said that they could be part of, especially since the religious leaders of the day would not even speak to them or look at them. So that's the first uh, component of uh, the audience. Actually, uh, verses 1 and 2 show us that Jesus is speaking to three separate audiences all at once. And uh, it might be interesting for you to stop and think who they are. We just identified one, of course, the Bible tells us clearly. These social outcasts, sinners and tax collectors. But then they also tell us that the Pharisees were there, the guys that Jesus had just had lunch with, followed him as he left that home. And they're standing around the crowd, muttering and complaining, and uh, that's when they said uh, that this man uh, welcomes sinners. They wouldn't even talk to these guys. And uh, so Jesus, in their eyes, couldn't possibly uh, be a, a pious religious teacher because he talked to sinners. We'll leave that conversation or that point uh, for another message. But who's the third audience or the third segment of the audience that Jesus is speaking to? Well, it's you and me. Because we learned that the word disciples in chapter 16, uh, the very first verse, would be better translated learners not the 12. Jesus is speaking to these social outcasts, and they're called by Luke disciples, meaning that they are learners. Well, we're learners also. We are learning about the kingdom. So the three uh, audiences uh, that Jesus is speaking to uh, include us, the Pharisees, and the social outcasts back in his day. In the first eight and a half verses, uh, Jesus t tells his parable. 
and it speaks to the spiritual needs of each one of those three audiences that he had in his mind. And the story goes like this. There's a wealthy man. He has a manager who takes care of his business affairs. Now, Jesus is actually making reference to the Pharisees because that's exactly how the Pharisees uh, conducted their, uh, their businesses. They had managers who wrote the contracts and uh, enforced the contracts and sold uh, various forms of commodities uh, to the people so that they could pretend, they, the Pharisees could pretend, uh, that they were just too spiritual and, and pious uh, to dirty their hands with such uh, trivial things as uh, contracts and making money, all of which, of course, was complete falsehood and a charade because they were very concerned about making money and what those contracts uh, would earn them. So in this story, this manager uh, had in some way, not defined, but some way, wasted in a dishonest way some of his master's money. And he's been called to account by the master uh, before he is terminated. He's been called for an account, uh, for an audit. Well, as he contemplates the fate of what's about to befall him, he realizes, of course, uh, his desperate circumstances. And he admits to himself he has no safety net. He has no means of support because he can't do manual labor, uh, and he's not willing, uh, he's too proud uh, to beg. So he comes up with a plan, and he's going to put his master's debtors uh, in a position of having loyalty to him as the manager instead of the master. And his plan is very shrewd. The manager discounts all of the contracts that his debtors, uh, the master's debtors, had with him. And that would allow him to collect money, but less than what the face value of the contract was. Now, this requires a certain amount of background information so that we can understand exactly where uh, this manager got this idea and what he's doing. And the background is this. The Pharisees took advantage of the people. They exploited them, um, all the while pretending that, that they kept the Jewish law perfectly and that they were totally righteous. You see, the Jewish law prohibited one Jew from charging another Jew uh, interest. That was not to be done. So in order to get around that provision of the law, what the Pharisees would do is that they would have their business manager write a contract uh, for 100 bushels of wheat, but they would only give uh, the baker or the customer, the debtor, 80 bushels of wheat. And with olive oil, they would sign a contract uh, for, a hundred, for 800 uh, gallons of pure oil, but they would only give 400 gallons. So you see, the, the Pharisees are pretty shrewd, uh, dishonestly shrewd also. They were allowed to pretend that they kept the law totally, um, while all the time they were breaking the law, and they weren't anywhere near as righteous as they pretended to be. Well, they even had a different profit margin, by the way, depending on the commodity that they were selling. Uh, as with the oil, uh, it's very easy to dilute pure virgin uh, olive oil with a, a, a lesser quality oil. And that's what they did. When they gave the guy uh, 400 gallons, it would be a blend. But the contract would specify that he had to return to them 800 gallons of pure virgin, uh, unadulterated uh, uh, olive oil. Well, of course, Jesus has their number, and he's calling them out uh, through the use of this parable. You can understand how they must have hated Jesus. They just had a rigorous conversation with him because he wasn't keeping their traditions and their interpretations uh, that they had placed on the law because he uh, healed a man on the Sabbath. And um, uh, Jesus was not keeping what they taught. He was keeping what God taught Moses. Well, here he's uh, threatening their income by exposing their corrupt business practices. 
which would have thirdly uh, just devastated their uh, reputation in the community as being uh, holy and righteous and uh, uh, you know higher than all the other people. So when this shrewd manager discounted these uh, invoices, um, what he was actually asking the debtors to pay back was the actual amount that they had received, not the face value of the invoices. Well, you can imagine how the debtors uh, just loved this manager. They couldn't believe such a windfall. And you know, the master, the Pharisee, he couldn't say a, a, a word without acknowledging that he had uh, engaged in fraudulent uh, invoices, created fraudulent invoices, and that he had broken the law. That was pretty sure. Well, as we read this parable, it would be very easy for us to say, come on, you know, this is a story about uh, Jewish culture in the very first century. We don't do business like this in any sense of the word. And um, it doesn't relate to us in the 21st century. And you would be mostly correct because we don't do business the way the Pharisees did business. But remember that uh, Luke says that Jesus was speaking to three audiences. Those, that word disciple that we said means learning or learners uh, includes us. So Jesus is teaching us as he teaches uh, these social outcasts, but he's also sending a message to the Pharisees all at the same time. But we don't get off the hook because Jesus knew very well that we would be studying this parable uh, today when he taught that parable. This is for us just as it is uh, for those people of that day. So yes, we don't do business the way the Pharisees. We don't have business managers, but here's the point. We've all been given wealth. We've all been given assets to manage. God has given each one of us both material wealth and spiritual wealth. We all have something uh, of material value that has been given to us. And while we have it in different amounts, uh, the source is all the same. Everything we have comes from the good hand of God. He gave it to us. Now, you may say, wait a minute. I worked to earn money to pay for the house that I have or the car that I have or the RV or the whatever we have. And I would say to you, who gave you the skills? Who gave you the opportunity to have that position that had that income that allowed you to have what you have. When you scratch it all down, whatever we have came from the hand of God. Secondly, we have spiritual wealth. If we call ourselves Christ followers, members of God's family or his kingdom, then we have been given spiritual wealth. First, we were given grace. By definition, grace is undeserved, unearned favor, a gift from God. He's given us faith so that we could respond to the love of God. We couldn't do that on our own unless God had given us a level of faith to make that choice to respond to him. He's given us mercy. He's given us compassion, forgiveness, righteousness. All of these things are spiritual wealth. So when you stop and you think about that everything you have comes from God, do you have all these spiritual value, uh, things of spiritual value God has given you? This parable is really about stewardship. What do we do with what God has given us, both materially and spiritually? Because you see, we're just as accountable to God as the manager was to his employer, his master, in this parable, in this story. And Jesus wants us to understand that God is watching how we use what he's given us and that we will be held accountable to him for how we use what he's given us. Now that kind of changes everything because as we go through this parable, 
we have to remember that we're in the same position as that manager because we are stewards, managers of things that God has given to us. Now, as we come to that eighth verse, and I want to read the first half of that eighth verse because it has caused a certain amount of um, controversy. Um, but Jesus starts teaching the spiritual principles uh, in the second half of that verse. But let me read the first part of verse 8. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. Now, it is true that the manager was dishonest. That's the adjective that describes him, dishonest. But Jesus, or the, Jesus had the master commend him for his shrewdness meaning that when he realized the pickle that he was in, he took immediate action. That's what the master is commending him for. He took action. He made a decision. And that's exactly what Jesus is asking us to do, to look at our circumstances, understand the, the values of the kingdom, how the kingdom works, and then make an immediate choice to change how we live. All right. In the second half, we see that Jesus uh, begins to teach uh, his parable. Look at the second half of verse 8. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of the light. So Jesus is making an unfavorable um, contrast between unbelievers, people of this world, and believers people of the light. Jesus is saying that the world spends a great deal of time and energy on gaining things that have no eternal value. They're earthly things. More time and energy in gaining those things than people of the light, believers, that's you and me, spend on caring for their eternal well-being. Think about that. If worldly people invest so much time and energy on material things that have no eternal value, then we as believers, members of God's family, his kingdom, ought to be as diligent or even more diligent in strategizing on how to build God's kingdom and build something that has eternal wealth for us. Jesus is kind of suggesting that our priorities may be out of whack, right? Look at verse 9. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now, Jesus is speaking of stewardship again, managing God's assets that he's given to us for his glory. He's urging us to, have, uh, to be strategic in our planning and be diligent in the execution of our plans that we should use our earthly material wealth that he has given us for eternal good. Remember, it belongs to him anyway, okay? So if unbelievers work to build their personal gain, their earthly uh, material wealth, even to the point of dishonesty like this Pharisee in the story, then we as Christians need to be wise uh, in, in the use of our wealth to build something that has eternal value. You know, what we get in eternal, excuse me, in material wealth, it only lasts for this in this world. You, you can't take it with you when you go kind of thing. It goes to others. It's called an inheritance or taxes, better yet. But the other builds eternal wealth that goes with us and stays with us through all of eternity. It sounds like store up treasures uh, in heaven uh, that Jesus says uh, in, in his Sermon on the Mount. Well, there are not, there's another phrase that causes people some frustration in the latter part of verse 9. He said, when it is gone, um, 
that's a little difficult to translate from the original language. But it refers to both the uh, end of our material wealth and the end of our lives here. When, when that's gone, how we invest our money and what we do with our time and energy and material wealth allows us to enter into eternal dwellings on a good footing. That's all. We are to in invest our material wealth now so that uh, in the life hereafter, uh, we have uh, wealth, eternal wealth, uh, that lasts. So basically, wise investments. Choose to invest wisely now because the rewards uh, are, last for eternity. You know, it strikes me that stewardship is a true sign of our commitment to the kingdom of God. It's an acknowledgement also, as is tithing, that God owns everything. Whatever we have came from his hand. And so to return a portion of it uh, in a tithe and giving to the church uh, that we attend and we learn from, uh, how we use our material wealth uh, to help others build the kingdom, uh, all of which yields treasures uh, or, or translates into treasures that uh, we do take with us. In fact, they're stored up in heaven waiting for us uh, when we go there. We'll look at verse 10. There are two principles here that we need to consider. Whoever can be trusted with little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Now, as I said, there are two principles that I want us uh, to look at here. Our Christian character is proven by our faithfulness with the small, ordinary, what we might consider to be trivial things in life. Faithfulness is no accident. Faithfulness comes from an intentional choice and it is reflected by our conduct in seemingly unimportant to humans and trivial day-to-day -day, uh, things. But Jesus is teaching us here that God watches how we uh, take care of those small, uh, insignificant, uh, worldly things. I, 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 here's an example. How do I treat people who can't do anything for me? Am I kind and gracious and patient? Or am I uh, indifferent and dismissive? You know, we think that God is only interested in the big things of life. And Jesus is teaching us here very clearly that God watches the small, little things because that really reflects on who we are at the core of our character. Secondly, it teaches us that Christian character is proven by handling secular uh, material things. You see, material wealth is not considered evil. It, it's just that it has no eternal value. So it's a question of uh, kind of priorities. How you use it can turn it into something of great value. Um, and, and that's what Jesus is saying. Look at life the way God looks at life. Well, let's look at verses 11 and 12. So if you have not been trustworthy in handing worldly wealth, who is going to trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Okay, stewardship is also here. Because how we use worldly wealth shows God that we can be trusted with spiritual wealth. Well, then what is spiritual wealth? Things that are important to God. People. People. Leadership of people within the church. Teaching Sunday school. Skills to serve. God gives us things and people, literally people, to be able to minister to uh, and, and to, to lead them. And in terms of people outside the kingdom, that would be called ministry opportunities. That's spiritual wealth. If we are faithful in the material things, God can trust us with what he calls true wealth. 
You see, God sees our character uh, in the little things of life, and he tests our character. He tests our faith through the management of those little things. They're not little to him. Thirdly, he tests our character uh, by our loyalty, and he teaches, Jesus teaches us that in verse 13. Look at that verse, 13. No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one, love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So you can't serve two masters. Jesus has already taught this in the Sermon on the Mount. This is not a new teaching. But this shrewd manager had tried that, and he gets blown out of the water. He's gotten caught, and now he's going to get terminated. You see, God demands of his children undivided and exclusive loyalty. Undivided and exclusive loyalty. Now think of it this way, too. In Romans, Paul tells us, Romans 8, 29, that we have been predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We call that sanctification, become more like Jesus. Jesus was obedient to the will of his Father to the point of an excruciating, horrific death. Why would we think that God would expect any less loyalty from Jesus, his followers, his brothers and sisters, us. You know, you can't expect the blessings of the kingdom with none of the responsibilities. Our character, our faithful obedience, and our conduct must reflect our devotion and our loyalty to the kingdom of God, building his kingdom, building eternal value. Then God can trust us with things that are important to him, the lives of others in his kingdom, and ministry to people who are outside his kingdom so that we can offer them and lead them into the, his kingdom based on their choice to respond to God's love and grace. You know, it strikes me how much Jesus thinks and teaches in absolute truth. There's no gray areas. There's nothing that's half-half. You know, it's, it's all or nothing. And his bottom line point, well, let's look at verses 13, or excuse me, 14 and 15. Now the Pharisees who loved money, we know that, heard all of this and were sneering at Jesus. And he turns to them and says, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men. But listen to this. But God knows your heart. Do you think that's not true for us too? What is highly valued amongst men, humans, is detestable. It's of no value in God's sight. Jesus' bottom line here is that God seeks our undivided and exclusive loyalty, commitment to building his kingdom its values, its growth, and uh, its blessings. The material and spiritual wealth that we have that's been entrusted to us is to be used to earn or to build his kingdom. And he will test our faith. He will test our commitment. And he watches our conduct, which proves to him, our Christian character, how we serve him and how we obey him. So the conclusion for us is we need to be intentional, we need to be strategic, and we need to be consistent in building God's kingdom. Be good managers of the wealth that God has entrusted to us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this parable and the truth that it teaches us, the values of your kingdom that we say we live in so that we can look at life through the eyes of God, his perspective, and that we have the same values that he does. We focus on what's important to him so that when we are in his presence, in, in your presence, in glory, 
that we will have stored up wealth there rather than here. Thank you for these truths, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week.